All right, we're going to get started. Um, so before we start, I want to get like a quick poll. I just realized this when I heard you guys talking. Um, who here would say that they know absolutely nothing at all about the subject of like arms and armor? <laughs> Sweet. Okay, I made this panel for you guys. So I made this panel in mind with the idea that like, a lot of people coming here would just not be super familiar with this kind of thing. So um, understand that this is a very broad subject. It is like incredibly broad because it is something that obviously people have been doing forever. So we have like 2,000, 3,000 years of history to cover here more, um, or not history, but like design concepts, like things of, these things evolve, right? So um, like there's just a lot to cover and I'm trying to cover it all in a short amount of time. The other thing I want to mention before we start is that I was originally slotted for a one hour time, so I had to extend the um, panel a little bit to include some things that I wasn't originally planning on. Um, so I go over a lot in it. I won't be, I don't think I'm gonna finish up the whole two hours, so it'll last as long as it lasts. And um, you know, at that point, if people wanna filter out that's totally fine. We'll have a Q&A at the end. I don't know how long that's going to go. Um, also, just uh, the other thing I wanted to say is like, I got notified I was going to be available to do this panel two weeks out. So I had two weeks to slap together a project on an absolutely massive um, like topic. So while it's something that I'm used to talking about and it's something I'm used to covering, um, I'm usually doing it with people who already got a pretty good baseline. They already kind of know what I'm talking about. And um, we usually talk about specifics and stuff like that. I'm gonna go really broad here, okay? And also because I had to prepare it in such a short amount of time, if I say something here that's not entirely accurate or isn't very, um, like you don't understand, you can ask about it in the Q&A for sure. But um, if I missed something, just wait till the end to mention it. Um, let's let me kind of go on about it and then uh, Afterward, if you have anything, any comments or anything like that, uh, go for it. Um, so yeah, uh, I think I'm gonna pretty get started here pretty soon. Um, I think everybody's here that's going to show up. So, let's see. Basically, if you didn't know, this is an introduction to designing armor for furry characters with Pelzi. Um, if you haven't seen my artwork before, this is some of it. Uh, I draw mostly historical arms and armor, uh, obviously on furry characters. I do some fantasy stuff too. This year, I'm very planning on going into a lot more fantasy stuff. Uh, I really want to go into that broad design of things because historical stuff is fun and it's really interesting. And for somebody like me who likes to draw a lot of detail, it is very satisfying to draw. But you don't flex as much creative muscle as you would doing something like fantasy because I do use a lot of references. I do use a lot of real world examples to basically influence the way that I do things. And you look at something a certain way for long enough and you start to not really get the idea of how that can be done other ways. Um, so broadening your horizons is very helpful there. So some of the things I'm gonna go over on here are a lot about creative, the creative process and the design process. And then towards the end, I'll get a lot more into the ergonomics type stuff, which is what I know a lot of people were coming here to hear. Um, I wasn't originally planning on going as in depth with it as I was the first time, but now that we got extra time, I could go on tangents. There's no really reason why I can't go into any of that kind of thing. So I'm just gonna go for it. So this is gonna be a very, uh, like, I'm gonna be kind of talking with them sometimes. These two guys can uh, put in their own input whenever they want. Um, we do these kinds of discussions a lot, so. I like hearing things from other people too because they, uh, they think about stuff all the time that I don't remember. All right, so first off, just about me. Um, I'm 22 years old. Uh, I'm former military. I'm an aircraft mechanic, and I've been drawing since about 2014 actively. Um, I was posting on FA around then. Um, I've basically been doing arms and armor type stuff the entire time I've been in the fandom. I can't tell you why, it's just something I really like doing. Um, but the reason I have former military and aircraft mechanic up there is because I'm not like a professional, I'm not a historian, um, I'm not even college educated. This is just something I'm passionate about and know a lot about. And people have asked me to do panels like this before because 
I talk to them and they're like, this is super interesting. Um, I feel like I could learn a lot uh, if you, know, you did a talk about it. So even though I'm not like a historian, which you should absolutely listen to and absolutely give that title some credit that it deserves because historian is a totally different thing than just somebody who is interested in history. So you're getting somebody who is interested in history talking about something I think I know decently well of um, because I've been doing it for so long. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm also a skunk. Look at him. He's adorable. <laughs> Got my first suit for him like two days ago. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> love him at the parties, bro. They love him at the parties. I'll tell you what. All right. So one of the big questions I was thinking about while creating this was like, why arms and armor and like combat in the first place? Is this something that even really has a place in the fandom at all when so much of it revolves around like super happy all the time, like good feelings, escapism, for good reason, by the way. I think escapism is a great thing and, and everybody needs it. Um, and I love that, I love that about the fandom. I love that it's a place where everybody can come in and have a, a, a good time and um, basically you know, forget a lot about the things that make their daily life so stressful. I think we're sorely lacking in that in a lot of people today. Like, like by and large, I don't know anybody that does anything the way furries do, like when it comes to fun. Um, but at the same time, combat has been a part of human life forever, like thousands of years. And it's only very recently that it's something that we don't even have to consider ever doing, okay? The idea of doing something like getting into combat on a large scale is terrifying. One of the most terrifying things I can ever imagine. Um, one story that comes to mind is... There are people who were said to have gone blind from no damage at all, no, no physical trauma, but sheer blind from the terror of being in combat. Uh, that was from a story at Marathon, which was during the Greco-Persian the Greco Wars, um, said to be struck blind from terror. We don't ever have to even consider it. We don't even have to think about it, ever, which, for good reason. You know, it's, it's, that's a great thing that we don't have to, obviously, but... Um, at the same time, I can't help but feel like there's a human experience that for thousands of years we've had to live with that is just gone, just absolutely gone from the modern mind. And I think there's a lot of stories that can be told about people who used to live in times where they had to live with things regardless of the fact that maybe you wanted to be an artist, maybe you wanted to be somebody who had, um, you know, any, like a merchant, anything like that. And you were thrust into a situation in which you had to fight. And honestly, I think that's, that's interesting. I, I'm very, very much interested in that. Um, I'm a big horror fan. Um, I'm a big, like, I like metal. I like horror movies. I'm a huge dark kind of things fan. So when it comes to thinking exercises and thinking about what other people have had to go through in life, combat's a huge one for me. It's just very interesting as, like, something I'll never have to think about but for like somebody living in, in Russia in the 1300s, there's no escaping it. It's just an aspect of life. That's just a part of your life now. Very much interested in that type of thing. So do I think it has a place in furry? Absolutely. Anthropomorphic characters are a reflection of human beings. They're anthropomorphized. And forever humans have been fighting and they'll be fighting forever in the future. Not like this, obviously, but I mean, you know, the, the past foretells the future in a lot of ways. So, um, yeah, I think, I think if, if anthos are a reflection of our humanity, then fighting is absolutely a big part of that. And it's absolutely why I think things like martial arts, like schools and training in the modern day is so, so relieving for people and, and such a physical, like, almost form of therapy because humans have, have been for a long time, you know, I, I think there is something in the human psyche that is finds competition like that gratifying. And obviously, I, I, I like that I can bring a little bit of it to the fandom. It's basically, it's just the darker side of, of the whole anthro thing. Furries are like us. So basically, my purpose of the panel is that I want to stimulate creativity, OK? I want to help you better communicate with your audience through cost costume design, which is what armor design is at the end of the day, um, to familiarize you with basic armor principles because 
the vast majority here already said they don't know anything about armor, which is good. That's fine. You're not going to know. <laughs> it's going to be a lot to take in, and I'm going to try and do it as broadly and as, as easily as possible, so I'm not going super in-depth. Um, and then I'm going to show you how to, how to apply these concepts to anthro specifically. Okay? Now, um, the main point I want to make from this slide is that absolutely none of what I'm telling you is a rule, okay? The only takeaways that you should take from this are positive ones. If you are looking at this and thinking, oh, I can't design this this way because that's impractical, you're thinking about this all wrong, okay? This should only help to better your artwork, okay? So if you're like, one of the big ones I see is always like, I'm gonna get into this later, but like, why would you have the ears sticking out of helmets? That's so impractical. They would be hit all the time. They'd be bruised all the time. Well, guess what? We're drawing furry characters, so you should have the ears out because if you don't and you tuck the tail in and it's hidden away, suddenly you just got something that looks more like a human, and that's not the point. That was never the point. If that's your art style, if that's what you're going for, if what your art style is, is or, or if what your concept is hides those things for an aesthetic reason, that's fine. That, if that's what you want to look for, it's good. But what I don't want is people thinking that they're railroaded into a certain design concept or anything at all just because it's impractical or just because it doesn't conform to whatever design idea uh, I think helps, okay? So basically, just if, if this helps you uh, with a little bit of inspiration, that's good. Um, if you come out of this saying, I just want to do it the way I've always been doing it, that's totally fine. All I really want to do is give you guys some stuff to chew on, some things to think about, uh, and basically have a dialogue a little bit about armor and making it look good, okay? So none of this is rules. Just, it's, it's, at the end of the day, just enjoy yourself in your drawing, all right? So when I talk about communication through design, what I mean is, is that design can be incredibly useful for showing intent and function. The more you can explain visually allows you to compound more information in a single picture. Packing information can, that can be inferred rather than told is the key to good armor design and costume design. I'm going to be honest. I hate lore. I do not care about lore. I never read lore. I don't, it's just, I like being told things visually, okay? I'm a visual kind of guy. I make artwork because I'm a visual person. I'm not a fan of exposition. I'm not a fan of being told things. Um, has anybody here seen Hodorowski movies? There's no way to like, you're told nothing. You just infer everything from the visuals. That's what I like. That's my favorite kind of thing. I like things being, you can kind of get a sense of where this came from and what it's used for and how without being explicitly told. And I think people are smart enough to get things most of the time as long as the design is good. So I'm going to give a few examples of kind of what I mean. So let's look at this guy right here, all right? Very recognizable character. He's a Roman legionary, all right? You could tell from the fact that his shield is unpainted. His armor is very simple. He is only covering one of his legs because that's his leg that's forward. That's the one that's going to be getting struck. The fact that he carries all of his equipment with him. He's got pack animals, right? He's got... A very simple setup, not a lot of frills. He's got a coat with him, probably because he might be getting caught out in the rain. His, uh, his helmet is open, but that's so he can keep his senses. He can look around the battlefield. He can keep his mouth open. He's going to be exerting himself heavily. He's going to be breathing a lot. He might be able to want to talk. He's got symbology on his helmet. You can tell that because this guy is not super frilled out, he's very utilitarian, you can tell that he is somebody who's preparing for war. His equipment has one use, and that use is to keep him alive. Now, he may have little frills here and there, certain things like religious objects, like the, the helmet design is, has a little bit of frill on there. It's kind of reminiscent of a Corinthian helmet, you know, reminding you of the old tales, make you look more imposing in person. But even that has a function, looking imposing in person. His helmet, the, the frills on it are largely for... Uh, a status thing you can you know see that kind of stuff uh, you know see somebody in there they got frills on their helmet they're probably important okay more important than you who doesn't <laughs> so 
Now, just off design, you don't have to know anything about when this guy was from, who he was even fighting for. He could be fighting for, you know, one of the, in the numerous Roman civil wars. We don't know. But you could tell that by his outfit, his, his boots, his little armor thing, you know, he's on a budget, but he's utilitarian and he's fighting in war. Now, let me show you another example. Same time period. But very, another very recognizable character. This guy is not worried about seeing very much at all. He's worried about seeing one opponent, one guy who's right in front of him, and he's got a lot of protection on his head because he does not want to die. It's pretty useful. Um, his helmet's got a lot of frills on it. Okay, it's fancy. People are going to see that. They're going to see that and think about him. He wants to make an impression. His crest on the top is not for any kind of signification. It's there for, for show and for fashion, obviously. But the fact that it's huge, it's got all these characters on it, his shield is all decorated out, his front plate is a, a woman on it, leaning around, chilling. Uh, he's got these protective, these big protective, bulky, like, cloth protections on him. He is gonna be seen, he's worried about how he's perceived. He also wants to be protected but it's clear that what he's doing, he's not worried about projectiles hitting his empty chest, right? He's not worried about all that. This guy is fighting in a tournament. This guy is fighting for sport. He knows who he's going up against. He knows that he doesn't necessarily need to know a lot about what's going on around him. He doesn't need to hear the audience. This guy needs to hear what happens if his officer yells something at him or, or orders a retreat or orders a maneuver. This guy doesn't care. He's got his ears covered. He's not worried about that at all. So from design, you can tell that these two characters with their own armor and their own like stuff, their own equipment, have two very different uses. Okay. So that's what I mean by you can show intent through design alone. If I showed you this character, you'd know he's a gladiator. If I showed you that character, you might not know he was a Roman soldier. You might not know he's any type of soldier but you could probably tell that he's decked out for war. So moving on, these two characters right here, one of them's got a giant cross on his chest, okay? One of them, like religion is clearly important to this guy, okay? <laughs> religion is probably what this guy's fighting for, okay? He's got a big old cross. He's a knight of St. Lazarus, okay? But this guy is dressed up as a jaguar, okay? <laughs> And he's got a big old club. He's got some kind of symbol on his shield. It's very clear that there's some religious significance to this outfit, okay? There's a priest back here holding the heart, all right? He's not wearing much, don't worry about him. But these two guys are dressed out like they're in a, a, almost like a kind of ceremony, like a ritual. Religion is important to both these guys' outfits. But the key difference here is, is that this guy's outfit tells you that combat is the ritual, and combat is part of the religion. But this guy's is telling you that religion is more of a motivator rather than the way that he's fighting. So the Aztecs, which is where these guys are from, the way that they conducted war and the way that they conducted um, promotions and stuff was based on capturing of people for sacrifices. That's how you ranked up in their system, and that was the main, as far as I know, a lot of the time, when they do wars, a lot of it was to capture people for sacrifices, okay? Religion and this outfit is a huge part of the ritual, okay? It's a huge part of that. But this guy, he's fighting like a war like we understand it, okay? He's fighting a war that is about winning a large-scale battle. He's not worried. He's worried about killing the other person. So these two show differences of also intent, but of a very different type. They show you the relationship that something like religion has to their outfits, okay? And to their entire conflict. So moving on. We got this guy here, okay? He's a soldier. You can tell from before, he's got all his stuff with him. He's looking utilitarian, okay? He's got his colors on him. You can recognize who he is in the battlefield, which side he's fighting for. He's got his symbols on him. But when it comes to actual armor, he's only really got a helmet. And he's fighting with a weapon that I bet if I gave to any of you right now, you would know how to use. Because it's a pointy stick, okay? <laughs> anybody can fight anybody with a pointy stick. 
It's not that hard. Um, you could tell from his design that he's intended for war, and he's also probably not super rich. Now this guy, from the same time period, is also in war, but look at all this. He's got golden gauntlets, he's got golden belts, he's got armor all over the place. He's got a jupon on top of his armor to, to, just to frill it up, just to give it some color, right? He's all decked out. This guy clearly has money. This guy clearly is of a different class than this guy. This guy sold a bunch of his possessions so he could go on conflict and hopefully make some money on campaign, okay? With loot, which is a huge part of conflict and why the average person goes into conflict, is to get loot. This guy doesn't care about loot. He wants to... He wants to capture somebody and ransom them for a, a, bankrupt the whole country that he's fighting with a single ransom, which happens more often than you think. Also, another thing, he's got some symbols on his chest there, right? Now, if you're familiar with this, this is a little bit uh, kind of on the wall here, but signifies a family. This guy's from an important family. This guy's nobility, and this guy's not. And you don't have to be an expert on armor, and you don't need to be an expert on history to tell that this guy's from a fancy family with a ton of money. He's a rich kid, right? And this guy probably is on campaign because he's desperately in debt. Same. So that's what I mean by communication of intent and communication of like who your person is just based on design alone. You don't need any kind of other words to go with this. You don't need any kind of uh, a thousand long, word long backstory or a history book to go with the fact to tell that this guy's a soldier and this guy's a rich knight, okay? You can just tell. Now, that's what I mean by signifying purpose. So, basically, what are some of the purposes you could be fighting for? You could have warfare is the big one. Obviously, everybody knows about warfare. Everybody wants to, that's, that's usually what you think of when you're thinking about armor and combat is warfare. There's tournament and sport, which is a big one. Tournament back then, that, that warfare and tournament line used to be really blurred. Because back in the day, uh, like 1000, 1000 AD, like uh, uh, the 1100s, tournament and warfare were almost the same thing. Because anybody was fair game, all right? Like, you know, like you're going to capture a lord, but the, the lord hides in somebody else's house. You can burn down that dude's house to get the guy out. Like, that dude didn't have anything to do with it, but it's tournament, so... Just remember that these lines are often blurred. Religious rights, like I gave you the example before, doing things like capturing people for sacrifices. And if you're designing your own fantasy world, maybe that's you know a broader thing than people realize. Like one of the things I'm excited about and I want to talk to you guys about is just showing you so many different ways in which warfare is conducted. Because everybody thinks about warfare from a very like sort of westernized modern standpoint of like. It's for these reasons, they want land, they want money, these types of things. A lot of the time back in the day, just killing the other person wasn't even the point, right? You don't even, you might not be doing it for land, you might be doing it for things like capturing people for sacrifices, capturing an important item. There's a lot of wars that were fought before, uh, during the Bronze Age, because if you captured the giant statue in the middle of their city, that was their god. They figured that as like, that was their, their actual deity in physical form. You could steal somebody's god. You could fight a war over that, all right? That doesn't involve taking a ton of land. It doesn't involve any of these things that we usually think of, but it is a way that people fought. And if you're designing fantasy, that's a hell of an idea. You could do a lot with the stuff that you find. Like, the farther you go back, there's all kinds of interesting ways and all kinds of interesting things that uh, uh, lead into warfare rather than just... Two big armies meet on a field and they fight, and then the other one takes the other one's kingdom. Okay. Ceremony. Ceremony is a big one. I'll tell you what. There's a ton of armor that's made for kings who never fought a battle in their life, but they like, sure like to go around on parade and they sure like to dress up like they're using it in combat, but they don't. <coughs> the coughing starts. Jesus. Good. Anyway, yeah. Like, for example, I don't know if you've ever um, seen. The armor with the incredibly big cod pieces. You don't know what a cod piece is. It's for your groin. Sometimes they're very large. Oftentimes that's to show that the person has royal lineage and that that's something worth protecting. 
okay? <laughs> now, a lot of the time, that's useful in combat, but a lot of the time it's put onto armor that you're going to show to the peasants because when the peasants see it, they're going to know you're important and that they don't maybe need to protect that, but you do. So you have a big fancy piece and it's even got a face on it. <laughs> I'm telling you, they do some wacky stuff. It's, it's, it's awesome. The more you look into it, the more they, they, they do crazy shit. But um, yeah, these two in the back, obviously examples of tournament armor. You, you want to be seen by the guys in the back. I'm the dude with the giant lion and horns on his head. And the, the French guy is the guy with the big fleur de lis. Like they, you want people in the crowd to see you and know who you are without squinting. Or, it's not like they have binoculars. It's not like they have big screens showing that kind of thing. So another good way to do design, and I'm going to get into this with a very example almost probably everybody will know, but is world building. Um, flesh out your world by showing off like good design, good visual design, right? For example, if I showed you a guy wearing a piece of bronze armor, you could probably tell that it was made a long time ago, or that your world is set a long time ago, or at least in a place with technology that we would recognize as being very old. So, some of the things to talk about, yeah, like technology is a good one. Obviously, the design shows you a little bit about like the conflict, like we were talking about the Aztec things. If you saw them, you might know that these guys are not worried about large-scale combat, they're worried about small scale, uh, you know, capturing people, that kind of thing. Like religion's very important to the nature of the conflict. Now, one of the major questions I want to bring into this at the end is, how does this setting around your conflict tie into the animal specific characteristics of your characters? And we're going to get into that more at the end. But one of the main points I want people to recognize is that like these things are fluid, right? So. Because we use such a very complex and very interesting thing of using animals rather than humans, there are a million different types of animals, right? And a million different kinds of reasons why, you know, maybe one of them would go to war over one thing. Something would be super important to one species, but not incredibly important to another one. So when you're designing fantasy worlds that have furry characters in them, tie in the actual anthropomorphic elements of your story into it. You know, furries aren't just characters to be dropped into a setting and made to play out that could be easily replaced if they were humans. These should be things that the setting revolves around the fact that they are anthropomorphic characters, at least in my opinion. Whenever I'm writing something and I'm trying to think about like how the actual setting and the story itself could not be done with humans. It has to be done with animal characters because the interplay between them is so specific to their animal characteristics. That's a huge thing that I really want to bolt on at the end. And uh, um, maybe I'll get into it at the very end if we get like more time. Who knows? Whew. Okay, good example. Dark Souls. All the armor in Dark Souls look like it's falling apart. They're so thin they make your character look like a corpse, okay? You can tell just by looking at the people in them that they're part of a world that's dying. They're part of a world that is on the, it's seen its glory days. You've got your knights, he's got a crown, he's all fancy, but it's deteriorated. It's literally rotting off their bodies, okay? You can tell that the world that they're inhabiting is decaying, essentially. It's, it's dying off. <coughs> all of the world in Dark Souls supports the core themes of the story. And that's what your armor designs and your character designs should reflect to. What is the main point of your fantasy world? What are the major themes? And you should be incorporating that into all aspects of your design. Dark Souls is a super common example of this because it's so obvious and it looks so good. I hear a lot of people say that they love the armor in Dark Souls because it looks realistic. Sort of, and yeah, sure, but like, look at it. It's so, like, the whole embers thing, the king of embers thing is like, it's, the flame is literally dying out, and you can see it on all of the designs. It's plain there. You don't need to be told. If you've ever played Dark Souls, you know they don't tell you shit. It's just like, figure it out yourself. Here you go. Drop you in the world. Figure it out, right? Now, a lot of people make three-hour videos going, oh, if you look at this item's description, it tells you that this guy died this way. And 
you're overthinking it massively. Just look at the fucking world around you. Just get get it. Get notes. Like like just look at things and be like, that's cool. I wonder why that's that way. Think about it. Figure it out for yourself. That's what you want to be able to do with armor design. You don't want to be able to just look at something and be like, I have no idea. This tells me nothing, right? This tells you a whole hell of a lot without saying anything at all. So, the question becomes, who are your characters? Uh, the design of your characters and their equipment should reflect the, re the relationship to their world and the story. Now, why is your character specifically fighting? Money, duty, religion? Those are all things you can signify by their outfit. Those are all things that you can signify by the design, and you should, because it's just good design. In my opinion, my uneducated opinion. I have no design classes or anything like that. I, I, like I said, I'm just... How your character engages in the conflict will determine how to design their equipment. So, the character, their role in the story, their function, and those sorts of things are really what's going to basically influence how you want to design the way that they look. All right? So, what somebody's, like, like, for example, you might think of it as class. If somebody's a paladin, you want to design their armor for a paladin, right? If somebody is a soldier, you want to design armor for a soldier. Now, I'll give some examples here. I'm going to try and break most of these down into three groups, and I'm telling you right now, that is a massive oversimplification of the conversation that I'm about to have. So bear with me. If you're going to look at this and go, oh, that guy's not technically a soldier, or that guy's not technically a nobility, understand I'm just doing it to, like, like I've got to broaden this, otherwise we'll be here all day talking about different types of people and different types of armor designs. So first up, we got soldiers, all right? These are guys who fight in big groups most of the time, okay? Remember, nothing here is solid. They oftentimes use weapons designed to be used in large groups with moderate training. Not no training, because a lot of people think that medieval soldiers or soldiers in general are just people that get you know, brought out of their homes, given a spear, and said to go at it. But most of the time, they have pretty good training, and they have a lot of time to train because they're on campaign for a long time. They get a lot of time to train. It's protecting your life. You're going to practice it. Okay. The level of professionality may vary from people like cannon fodder, which was used um, to peasant levies and to citizen soldiers, okay? Like three different types of people, to cannon fodder, peasant levies. Levies are people who have a day job. You're probably a farmer if you're a peasant, okay? If you're a serf, you're probably farming, okay? So sometimes when fighting season comes, they get all those guys together and they say, all right, get what you need done on the farm, and then we need you for a campaign, okay? So that's what a levy is. A professional soldier is somebody who's not a farmer. They fight full time, but they're still a soldier, okay? They're still a guy who has to think about cost effectiveness for their armor and things like that, okay? Now, with these guys, you can really get creative on equipment because, you know, oftentimes in most fantasy settings, you don't usually see it this way. You watch The Lord of the Rings. The Gondorians, uh, you know, people of Gondor, they have all the same weapons, they have all the same equipment, they have all the same armor. I think that's a massive missed opportunity. You could dress these guys up, like just the, the variation in here alone. Like think about the fact that like, there's no Amazon to buy things off of. There's no like, you, nobody's buying anything standardized. So really, if, if back in the day I wanted like a helmet, I could go up to Strauss, who's the helmet maker guy, and I'm like, look dude, um, I want a helmet, but like, I'm really worried about like getting like my ears cut off. So I want the brim extended on the sides, right? He could probably be like, it'll cost you extra, but I could do that for you. So nothing is standardized. You can absolutely just um, like it, basically not come up with whatever you want. But in a fantasy world, I really like seeing this level of variation because again, it tells you something about the setting. They're not all getting it from the same place. There's not a giant foundry making equipment for soldiers. Now, some places did have that. The Roman Empire is a good example of a place that had soldiers with a decent, good level of uh, uh, standardization. Not complete, but pretty decent, okay? So, go wild with these guys. Enjoy designing them. That's the best part about this, is that you get to design a bunch of stuff. So examples for these guys just would be like a Macedonian pikeman. He needs to protect his legs, he needs to protect his chest, he needs to protect his head. He's got, he's got that covered, 
He wants both of his hands to use his weapon, right? A pike is a really good soldier weapon because you use them in a big formation. You can fight a lot. You know, they're really useful for fighting against stuff like cavalry and those noble guys you're scared of so much because they got all the fancy armor. They're all going to be riding horses, okay? So that's a good example of a guy who's very utilitarian design. And you can tell by looking at him, would he want, like, gaunt, like gauntlets or, or arm armor? Probably, but he probably wouldn't need them as much as he just needs it on his chest, his legs, and his head. A longbowman. Now, a longbow is a harder weapon to use than you might think. That takes a lot of strength, but at the end of the day, you can learn it without taking years upon years upon years of training, especially if, you've been, if you're a hunter, especially if you grew up using a bow for any other number of means. His clothing and equipment would he like armor? Probably. He'd probably like a breastplate or something, or a better helmet to protect his head, but he just settled for a small, you know, little dome-sized helmet because really, at the end of the day, that's all he needs, okay? He's on a budget. He doesn't need to spend that much money, okay? And then, just to get out of the West for a little bit, Japanese Ashigaru, he's got his chest, he needs, he needs to protect his chest from spears and things like that. He's got his hat, it's not fully, it's not the full samurai thing going on. It doesn't have the mask or the big mustache. It doesn't have the, the, the cool, um, like, lamellar style, like, back plate or anything like that. Nothing really on the legs, a tiny bit on the arms. He is clearly just getting what he needs to fight in the spear wall, and he's good. And again, he's got a spear, like I said, peasant weapons, peasant, like, not peasant, soldier weapons, really, <coughs> Oftentimes are pull arms because spiky, quick, little pokey weapons are really easy to use. You don't need a lot of training. So that's one type. To give some fantasy examples to show that this is not just a history thing. The Skyrim guys, the, the town guards. Look at them. They're a town guard. They're not rich. He's got the cloth stuff. Oh, these are storm cloaks. Yeah, storm cloaks. He's got a gamp, like a, a, a cloth covering and a chain mail underneath. Now, you might be thinking, oh, aren't you supposed to wear the cloth underneath the chainmail? Yes, but a lot of the time, people do that because if you're on campaign and it gets wet, um, your armor can rust. So covering it up is oftentimes a really good idea. So anyway, look at them. They got like straw, like gauntlets here and like these sort of okay helmets. But what you remember is that they have the same outfit pretty much as the town guards. So these guys aren't part of some massive army. They're average like essentially the equivalent of rebels, right? That's basically what they are. Now, another example. Oh, and also there's that variation we talked about. They kind of just wear whatever type of helmet or whatever type of armor or things like that. Another example, The Witcher 3. And I'm sorry, I, The Witcher is going to come up. It's just a good example of great design, okay? You can tell by looking at this guy, he's a soldier. He's a town guard. He's got his pull weapon, for example. He's got... He's armoring his legs, he's trying to, but he realizes the knees are more important than the arms, and the, you know, he's got his elbows and his gloves there, because that's the most important parts to protect. He's got his helmet, but he doesn't have a visor. He's basically just armoring what needs to be armored, and you can tell by looking at that, that this is not a guy of nobility. This is a guy who's buying things on a budget, because he doesn't necessarily need to spend all the money in the world, and oftentimes has to need to spend money on other things. Like, a noble only has to worry about fighting. This guy might have to worry about tending his crops at the end of the year. So that leads us into our next, like, style of character, all right? Would be like nobility, okay? These guys fight in smaller groups. There's not as many of them around. Soldiers are numerous. These guys are not as numerous. They usually have equipment that is dedicated and only usable in war. A lot of those pull weapons that I talked about could also be farming instruments. And you might be surprised to hear that one of the most common weapons in the medieval world in its entirety was essentially a modification of a branch clearing rake. Basically, it's called a bill hook. They're really cool. But a sword and a lance, if you're a peasant, where are you gonna go to get trained in something like a sword and a lance? So if you see somebody using a sword, you already know that at some point they had to train and they had to be like, taught to use these things. There had to be a reason. There's somebody who's trained in war. So these guys, just by their look, have a lot of training. 
They fight for things like sport, tournaments like I was saying before, prestige. Sometimes these guys don't, they don't have to fight. The soldiers could do all the fighting, but they're there because they want that prestige. They want that sweet prestige. And obviously land, they get the main benefits from conflict. You know, peasants and the, the soldiers get money, but these guys get a lot of the land. They get the main benefits here. <clears throat> Oftentimes, and I would say most times, nobility fights mounted. They fight on horseback. Soldiers cannot afford horses most of the time. But nobility, they're bringing three, four horses with them on campaign. Because your war horse, that thing sucks to ride, okay? That thing's lumbering and heavy, and you ride it, and it just feels like shit, okay? But you get the nice female uh, Persian horse for when you're riding around uh, uh, on your daily campaign, and then that's actually nice. So you need a lot of money to fight mounted, all right? Because your horse can die on campaign. They could die for any number of reasons. So they're usually out of the expense wheelhouse for your average guy. So if you see somebody on a horse, it just has an air of, of, of money to it. It has an air of nobility. So, yeah, these guys are oftentimes very wealthy. And war is their day job, okay? If you're a noble, you only know, like, your only job is, is war. That's it. Like, I don't know if you guys knew this, but in the, the, the nobility, the knights of the medieval ages, that's all, that, that was their role in society. They were thought of as protectors, which is a horrible understanding of how, what role they have in society. But back then it was thought that these are the guys that are going to do the fighting for you when push comes to shove. These are the guys that protect you, okay? So all they need to do is learn how to fight. Spoiler, that's not how it works. But that's how they thought about it, and that's also important. So, examples of nobility, you got somebody like a companion cavalry guy, okay? You look at him, he's got golden armor or bronze armor, shined beautifully, he's got a fancy shield, he's on a horse and he's got a big lance. If, you're a, if I gave you a lance and put you on a horse, you'd have no idea what you're doing. That's something you have to be trained to use. Obviously, a western knight. Good example of what I was talking about, these helmets and these gorgets are made to deflect lances. And you can tell by looking at them that this guy is worried about fighting other people on horseback. He's worried about fighting other nobility. He's worried about fighting people who are going to be using the same kind of weapons as his. So this like helmet style of, of like super long sleek plates that hug close to your body, very, it just by their very nature, it, it looks refined. It looks prestigious. It looks fancy. <coughs> now, last one. I don't want to delve on these too much because I know the point's not history stuff. Just to show you that, like, it's not always the same way. Japan has their own nobility, the samurai, right? Now, they have a very different function in society than somebody like a knight would. But at the same time, the bow is a weapon of nobility in Japan. It's something that they had to be trained on to use. And their armor reflects that their main role is fight. Its main role is combat, okay? And obviously, he's mounted. He's even got a guy with him. Here's another thing. If you've got a guy carrying your stuff around with you, obvious that that guy's important. Obvious that that guy has money. So, it's a big one. Now for fantasy examples, the Nilf Guardians. You can look at this guy compared to the last one, and this dude's got money. Just, he's got the decked out blackened armor. He's got giant boots, a big helmet with wings on it. Look how flashy that is. That dude does not look poor. He is rich, and he wants you to know he is rich. Okay? Somebody like Ornstein from Dark Souls. His arm, look, it's like golden. It's like sleek. It's got that nice, sleek design curves that I was talking about before. He's somebody who fights dragons. He's not the average hollow that you killed 10 million times. Okay? He's got... Super sleek, fancy, designed armor specifically for him, okay? That's another thing, is armor for these guys is designed specifically for them. Because you take something like a calf, and that looks different on everybody, right? You can't just buy that off the shelf. You have to get fitted for that, like a suit. And somebody like Jamie Lannister from uh, Game of Thrones. Their whole family, the Lannisters, all look like the old, posh, rich guys of Westeros, because they are. And they look the part. They got lions on them. That's another one. Just the fact they have lions already is a symbol of prestige. 
and a symbol of, of basically arrogance for their whole family. The red and the gold, they just look rich. And he doesn't even have nearly as much as some of the other guys do. So these are ways to signify class in society. Now, our last one would be something I'm going to call warriors. Now, that word doesn't mean much. I'm just using it to talk about this type of person. These are people who are outside the first two groups, but are still engaging in regular combat. They're mercenaries, bandits, tribal warriors, pirates, explorers, bodyguards, okay? They may not be fighting in large-scale war and large-scale formations the same way soldiers are, but they're also not rich the way the nobility is. They oftentimes fight for money, personal glory, worldly advancement, things like that. You might be a mercenary, right? And if you capture uh, you know, the Duke of Province or something like that, and you ransom that guy off and you make enough money from that, which you could, you might just be able to get a place in the nobility yourself. So these guys are trained professional fighters even though they're not nobility, they're not rich. And these guys have a ton of variation in equipment and a ton of variation on tactics. And you can go hog wild with these guys because there's no rules anymore. These guys dress up in whatever the hell they want. Okay? Good examples would be like a Lanschnecht. These are mercenary characters. Look at that giant hat. He wants you to know he's got money. Okay? He's got a fancy outfit with a ton of color and a ton of frills. Okay? But at the same time, his armor's still utilitarian. He's still got the pull weapon, okay? He's not necessarily a nobleman. You can tell by looking at him he's not a nobleman. Now these guys are Thracian tribal warriors. These guys don't fight in a big army or in a big formation. They just want to capture, I don't know, enough money to sell and then, you know, get a bigger yurt or something like that. Get a bigger hut. Get a bigger, you know, these guys fight with things like javelins, which, you know, as a tribal warrior, you probably knew how to use from things like hog hunting, things like that. So these guys are decked out however they want. They got armor and stuff. They're basically fighting however they want. And then you got something like a gallo glass, who's somebody's bodyguard, okay? This guy's whole job is to fight, but he's not rich. And he's not part of a noble class. So he doesn't have a lot of insignia. He doesn't look super fancy, but he has a lot of weapons on him. Because this main guy's job is to protect somebody who does have a super high family and does have a super uh, in, in, important heir to them. This guy's his bodyguard. All he cares about is getting paid and killing the dudes trying to kill whichever nobleman he's attached to. Fantasy examples. The bandits from Skyrim. He just, he just looks like a bandit. It's the average bandit look, okay? Now, I use a lot of Skyrim because it's very obvious their design choices with them, right? But at the end of the day, it's very standard fantasy -y. The Witcher, I love this one because he fits perfectly into this group. But at the same time, if you told somebody, oh yeah, that guy's a Witcher, and they never played the games or don't know anything about it, they'd have no idea what the hell you're talking about. But you can look at him and tell he's not in an army. Where's his, he doesn't have anything that even closely resembles a uniform. He has money because he's got two swords, and swords are something I know are hard to use. Because if I handed any one of you a sword and you didn't know how to use it, you would be absolutely clobbered by somebody who did. I can't emphasize enough that swords are something that, uh, that show that somebody knows how to fight, that somebody's been trained on how to fight. The Witcher clearly knows how to fight, and he's clearly geared up for war because that's his job, but he's not a warrior. I mean, I mean, he's not a soldier, he's not in an army, and he's not a nobleman. And then somebody like the Rangers from The Lord of the Rings. They fight asymmetrically. You could probably fit him somewhere into that soldier group. But at the same time, he's not in a big force. He doesn't need to worry about, you know, uh, the kinds of things you worry about in a normal army. So those are, my, those are my examples for just three different types. So as an objective, what you want to show is intent and purpose in the design and armor of the costume. Reflect who your characters are. Basically, what they're fighting for and where they come from, all right? I show you a soldier, you can tell he's poor. He's probably fighting for money, probably fighting for to support his family, okay? I show you a nobleman or somebody like a big knight, right? You can tell he's fancy. You can tell he's probably not fighting because he needs to. He's probably fighting because he wants to, unless you just clear otherwise in the story. 
Relay important information to your audience through clever visuals without the use of exposition. I'm not a fan of exposition, I've already stated. I like showing things through design visually, basically. That's the whole point of the panel. <laughs> so 101 on armor, just for a, a given introduction to the people who already said they don't know anything about this type of thing. Um, we'll get into the furry stuff soon, I promise. <laughs> the practicality trap. No design is 100% practical, even the ones that people use in real life to protect them from getting killed, okay? So if somebody points out on your artwork, that's not practical, tell them the fuck off. Because, <laughs> first of all, they're being a dork, okay? Stop, it doesn't matter. Focus on good design, focus on good communication and good aesthetics. Don't let practicality take away from your art ever, okay? It does not matter, the only function that taking into things like practicality should have is making it look better. Only use it if it can make it look better. Now, basic concepts. Armor's gotta fit the needs of the combat, all right? So don't design something that is meant to be used on horseback and have it be used for a character that fights primarily on foot. It just doesn't make a lot of sense, mostly, okay? It, it's gonna confuse the design if you let people look at something and kind of tell that this guy you know, he's got freaking stir, he's got like the, uh, the spurs on and all that, looking really fancy, and he's just walking around all over the place. You look ridiculous, okay? <laughs> just think about things like how easy is it to move, and how well does it protect you? Because if I show you something that's like a piece of armor, and it's got a big gaping hole in the front, and you can stab right through it, somebody's just going to say, why the hell didn't they stab him through the giant hole there? Like, these are all things to keep in mind within reason, okay? So, basic overview. It's like my first piece of art that's made it into this damn thing. <laughs> okay. Just to give you guys an overview for people who don't know basic terms. What goes on your head is a helmet, okay? The thing that comes down in front to cover your face, that's a visor, okay? Now, a lot of people think that these are used on foot combat. I think they were. But I think most of the time you probably had it up because you want to have your senses open. I can't overemphasize how important things like being able to breathe, being able to hear, being able to talk, and being able to see well, how important those things are. So a gorget is what protects your neck. It goes around your shoulders and it comes up around underneath your neck. Basically very easy. You don't want to get stabbed in the neck. So when I bring those up later, that's what I mean, is neck armor. A pauldron goes on your shoulder, it's just shoulder armor. A rondel is any type of armor that is sort of round shaped usually, but it can be other shapes, that kind of sits in front to protect something like your armpit or your groin. Somewhere that's like flexible that you want to keep loose, but you don't want to just leave open for somebody to stab right into, right? Something like that, okay? You have your gauntlets, okay? Those are to protect your hands. Those are super important. Sabatons are for your feet. They're basically just foot armor. Greaves protect your shins, okay? Now, a Palane and a Cooter, you'll probably never hear again in your life. But if you want to Google them, I put them on there so you know what to Google, okay? For pictures of references. And a tabard is what you wear on top to show things like family crests, pretty colors. You want to dress that thing up, okay? You want to look nice. So that's what a tabard is. Just so when I say those things later, kind of understand it. So there's all kinds of different types of armor, obviously, everybody knows. You can make armor out of steel and iron, bronze, hardened leather, okay? Hardened leather is a really common one, people don't realize. Cloth, how many times have people designing armor only do it off metal because that's all that they know, okay? People don't realize cloth is a huge, really good armor. When you actually layer it over itself and use it as like protection, it's great. Silk, very hard to cut through. It's super cut resistant. If you've ever tried to work with it before, it sometimes can be super, like, it's very cut resistant. A lot of people use silk. People don't realize it's great armor. Mail, obviously, chain mail. Everybody knows chain mail. But you could also use things like wood and bone. Those are very common types of armor, too. Get creative is my point, is when you're designing fantasy armor, get creative with materials, because the more creative you are, the more varied your designs will look, and the more you can make things feel otherworldly. Because if you just design things like a western knight all the time, because all you've ever seen is Lord of the Rings, and all you've ever played is Dark Souls, all fantasy is going to start to look the same. 
I want to see more crazy designs. I want to see more super interesting designs. I want to see more designs made out of things that people didn't even know were possible, okay? If you have specific materials in your world that are better for this kind of thing, use them. There's no rules on that, just use whatever you want. One of the things I was thinking about for like sci-fi armor, they have that like material that the harder you hit it, the more you impact it, the more resistant it gets, the stronger it gets. That's a real thing. If you incorporated that into your sci-fi armor, that'd be freaking sick. It's like super flexible, but the moment you hit it, it turns rigid. Awesome. I don't know why I'd ever see that kind of thing. I don't know. People just don't think about it. Okay. Now, forms. So those are materials, right? Forms, things like plate armor. Obviously, everybody knows what plate armor is. Mail, lamellar. Lamellar is basically what you think of when you think of scale armor. It's little pieces tied together over each other, and they just layer them over like that, over and over and over. That's what's on this guy. That's what's on his horse. He's a Mongol, by the way. Very cool. Um, brigandine. Barely anybody knows about brigandine, unless you're like in this like super dorky circle of people that are. Um, brigandine is metal plates riveted onto a cloth backing. So basically, it's not as expensive as getting something like a full breastplate, but you can get little pieces and rivet them in to make something that's sort of like a breastplate, but is different and cheaper and can be bought off the shelf and not have to be made to your exact specifications. That's a good thing that's like a, uh, uh, that'll show a difference in class. Like if somebody's super rich, they'll have a breastplate. If somebody fights a lot, but just, you know, they can't afford one, they'd get a brigandine. And scale. Scale armor is real, and a lot of people don't realize that it is, but it is real, it's just not super common. Uh, that's when it's riveted at the top and layered over itself. Cavalry guys like to use it a lot, and it just looks good, so I don't know, people use it when it looks good. All right, so if you didn't know what lamellar was, that's what it is. You can see here the scale's a lot better, they just interlace over like that. This is an example from China. This is an example from Europe, and this is an example from Japan. If you didn't know what this stuff was made out of, that's what it is. It's very small scales tied together, basically. This is brigandine. You can see, you can tell it is by the rivets on it. This is one from China. This is one from Europe. And this is one from India. So these things are not one thing that is used in one specific place, and nobody else uses it because it doesn't work. Everybody uses stuff like this because a lot of design principles and a lot of uh, armor principles are the same. Um, obviously, if you need to protect yourself, <coughs> there's good ways and there's bad ways. So you have two people that are not completely disconnected from each other, but maybe these things show up independently because people just come up with the same ideas. So here's some more examples of the ones we're going over, things like mail, things like cloth, this cloth armor. But what I want to demonstrate here is that these things are not always worn alone. They're most of the time worn together. So layering armor is super important. If you have armor, it doesn't matter if you've got like a naked chest and like a, a metal breastplate on top of it. If you get hit, that's gonna hurt a lot. You need padding underneath there, okay? And the way that you do that is by having a padded jacket and you can just tie all the things onto it that you want to. So if you want lamellar tied on there, you just have that strapped on. But you want this like, very nice, like make sure there's room for padding in your armor. You just have like it just on bare skin, unless you're like a like 90s barbarian, I think it looks really cool. Um, again, only if it looks cool, think about things like padding. If it doesn't look cool, don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. Um, also, going back to like these things aren't always alone. This is a chain mail tied onto a cloth gambeson. Super nice, super cool looking. Looks very witchery to me. I'm pretty sure that's where they got the design idea from. The Witcher, great example of like somebody who uses real interesting design principles and applies them to fantasy. So, when you're designing armor for somebody who doesn't necessarily just get whatever they want, oftentimes it's good to think about things like order of importance. So the number one thing, if you just have 10 bucks to buy armor with, all right, you're like, I got a fight, but I got broke as shit. You buy a helmet because you don't want to get hit in the head. That's as simple as. Super simple. The number one thing you're going to buy is a helmet. 
then you probably want a breastplate to protect your chest so you don't get stabbed in the heart and die, because that's where your vitals are. Then protect whatever exposed target. If you're somebody who has a big shield, maybe you're not worried about fighting, having gauntlets so much because you, your hands are already protected. You've got a big shield. Um, greaves are a big one for guys who fight in big formations because oftentimes if somebody's got a shield over here and their other hand's occupied with something like a spear or a polearm, sometimes the only thing that's exposed is this like foot and the shin. So you might want to get some greaves on there. Basically, think about the combat in your fantasy world and think about how, like, think about the order of importance. Think about what actually needs to be protected, okay? Now, I'm going to get into the anthro stuff. How is combat made more interesting by anthropomorphic animals being in your setting? This is the key point here, because this is what, like, before I just wanted to familiarize people who didn't really know about armor with all the things you can do with it, right? But when you're bringing it into a furry setting, the furry part has to matter, okay? It should matter because you're designing art or, or you're making artwork for furries. What I love so much about the fandom is that furries are infinitely more like variable and infinitely more like explorable than humans are. We all generally have the same anatomy. <coughs> We have the same psyche, we all got the same brains, that type of thing. The differences between humans are very small, but everything that goes into furries is different based on species, based on how they're drawn, based on the story that they're in, based on the setting that you put them in. Because one world in somebody's furry setting doesn't have to anything resemble the world in somebody else's furry setting. So really, the number one question on all of this is thinking about how this, these concepts interact with your furry setting, okay? With your, the, the furry characters in your world. That's the big one. I'll give you an example. Applying it to Anthros. How much does conflict in your world reflect and revolve around its furry characters? Is the design of your characters and their equipment directly tied into their animal characteristics? It should be. If you're designing a cheetah character, right? Why? would you put them in the most like hunkering, lumbering armor that you possibly could? Because their whole thing that makes them cool is that they run fast, right? So you might want to put them in something that's silk, that is still cut resistant, that has a cloth backing, maybe lamellar too, hardened leather. It's still good armor, it still protects them, but you don't want to take away the things that make furries interesting. You want to emphasize them. You want to have a design that you can see and go, this guy can go fast in this, all right? I don't have an example. I wanted to make so much art for this. You guys have no idea. But I just, two weeks, I didn't have any time, all right? So this was done for my friend Caradas. But you want to emphasize the furry characteristics in your world, all right? You want to emphasize them, not take away from them. So I'll give you an example. I was designing a world that uh, uh, was very reminiscent of, like, our ancient world, right? So I was using coyotes for my soldiers in one of my settings. I wanted them to be very tribal, almost like pre-Roman uh, Italian peninsula, right? So these guys would be interacting with other people who were like them. Coyotes, foxes, jackals, that type of thing. Similar, but not complete, like, like similar people, but they're still different in their own ways. The ones I was designing for the coyotes, I really liked them because they're great on campaign. They make great soldiers. Coyotes, by their very nature, they don't have like set areas where they live. They don't have like a nest. They go around and they scavenge and they find things that make them, you know, they find food on their own. They don't need a lot of upkeep. So these guys could go a really long distance and it totally changes the nature of combat when you account for like furry characteristics like this, right? So they work well in packs. These guys would be great people for fighting in large groups. Even like uncoordinated ones, you know, like a, a, a fursona species that naturally hunts in a group is going to be like, you should be emphasizing the fact that they are great at things like teamwork. Stuff like that is really where you want to bring out the interesting characteristics in your furry setting. Okay. Like individual hunters could be something like great fighters on their own, but these guys in a pack are freaking deadly. 
And I wanted to use them for soldiers too because they're lighter and faster than other mammals despite their size. They can go a long distance, all right? They can go a super long distance. They can fight decently well and they're great on campaign. These guys can be, they could march for miles, all right? And not have to worry too much about if their food lines get cut off, if their supplies or logistics get cut off, these guys can probably just eat whatever, all right? So, and also if you'll notice, I gave them javelins and I gave them very simple equipment because javelins are a weapon that would be used well in a group. Simple as, basically, like, like I'm, I'm emphasizing these things through the design and not giving them things that would take away from their natural characteristics, okay? So that's an example of one of the designs that I did using this process. So think about things like how aggressive your animals are, right? If you have a super tame, super easy species that is not super aggressive, Maybe you want to reflect that in the way that you design them and the roles that you put them in. If there's, you know, there's a million different, you know, positions you can put people in in this setting. They could be um, things like, like, like work in the supply chain, handle horses, handle the food, things like that, okay? People like tigers, you probably want to keep on the front. Which animals like to fight alone and in packs, right? The animal's best senses, if somebody's a really good smeller, you don't want to take that away with a design that totally removes their ability to smell anything. You probably want to emphasize that. So if somebody, I don't know, has like a star-nosed mole fursona for some reason, probably shouldn't hide that nose. Now, um, anatomy and diet, basically any natural advantages that your character has should be emphasized through the design alone, okay? Keep those things open, emphasize your animal's characteristics. So. Speaking about furconomic differences, <laughs> things like snouts, paws, tails, legs, horns, and antlers, okay? It's important to keep these areas in mind, obviously, because when you make your designs and you try to make them look like they would actually protect them, these are important things to keep in mind. And this is where we get to the point where a lot of it is based on art style, and a lot of it is based on how much you actually want to delve into these things. So some people, don't care at all about this, and that's very good. I think if you're not worried about it at all, you're probably on the right track. But if you are somebody that wants to make sure that your stuff looks like um, it would actually protect them in a fight um, and really want to get into it, here's just some stuff about how like these areas to keep in mind. So I'm going to make a note here and piss off every single avian in the entire community. <laughs> if your character can fly, I'm not counting them, and I'm not worried about them, and I'm not going to talk about wings, and I'll tell you why. Because the moment you add characters that can fly, you're jumping thousands of years of, like, technological evolution and getting to a point that changes things that cannot be accounted for, is the only way I can explain it. I'll give you an example. If Cyrus's army could simply fly over the Spartans <laughs> at the hot gates, then that battle never happens. And it becomes the point where it's like, why didn't they just fly away? And if you can do that, if you, even, I, I heard somebody say, well, just, they're so frail and it takes so much to fly, just don't give them any armor at all or any equipment, then it balances it out. No, it doesn't. Because all I need to do is decide that, um, use them for scouting. They have information that, that's omniscient, basically, about what's going on in the world now, okay? They could fly to somebody's village and pillage it while the army's away, and nobody could do anything about it because they could fly. And you, oh, I'm going to station guards there to fight them off. Cool, well, they just won't land where you're at. <laughs> like, they could burn things down with no restrictions at all. The moment you add flight, combat fundamentally changes immediately. And there's a few things you can look at, like, oh, well, it'd be cool to have a character who could fly and do things like fighting with a lance from the air. That would be cool, but then that would become the best fighting style known to man, and nobody would ever be able to counter it really effectively. Okay? I would just use bows. Cool, they wouldn't fly near you. They'd fly somewhere else. Guess what? You have to walk to catch them, or at best, ride a horse. I'm not talking about avians. I'm sorry. That's like a whole other three-hour panel just talking about this. <laughs> I'm not doing it, okay? I've already got, I've already told you my time constraints here. So 
I'm going to go right into the head with snouts because this is the big one. Okay, this is the big one that is like important. Generally, the most vulnerable part of any furry character is their snout. You have a ton of nerves in your snout, most animals. Now, this isn't applied to all of them. I'm speaking specifically about canines in mind, but this is a general rule. Animals like to have good smelling, and a lot of the times, they have a ton of nerves in their nose and a ton of like blood vessels that run through the snout. So this is not an area that can be ignored because it becomes a vital, okay? It's a vital part of your body, and it hangs out in front of your face, which is already the number one spot that people want to attack because it contains your brain, but like it immediately becomes just the easiest thing in the world to hit, okay? Because it's right out there. Getting hit in the face is already kind of easy, but if you're a furry, your snout's just like right there. It's just, when somebody just wants to fucking hit it. <laughs> it's very sensitive, very exposed. It's hard to protect. Because the moment that you try to do things like armor it directly, you've restricted breathing, which is a killer on the battlefield. You restricted things like smelling. You've restricted things like communication because now you can't talk because it's all armored up. It's a very important spot to treat very carefully and think about all these things with. So you've got to armor it while retaining all of your senses, okay? Now, it will almost always be vulnerable to blunt force trauma, and that's partially just a fact of life that you're going to have to be okay with. But if it's any consolation, I think everybody's head, no matter what armor, is probably subject to some level of blunt force trauma. You get hit with a mace in the head, I don't care what kind of armor you're wearing, you're probably going to get that thing bouncing around in there. So you'll probably not enjoy that very much. So I have an example here just to show you what we're talking about in terms of like sensitivity. These are the blood vessels that go through your snout and all the way to your nose. Very important to keep this like protected because this, think about the fact that like if a blade comes down anywhere near here, that's gonna hurt like a bitch. And you're probably gonna die because you're gonna bleed out from all of that, okay? Super important. So what do you do? One of the big ones that I like is called cutting off lines of attack, okay? If you're using something like a large weapon, like a large edged weapon, like something like a sword, you don't necessarily need to armor the entire circumference and every spot of your snout if you have something there keeping the bar from ever reaching you. Because these things are rigid, all right? Like, this side doesn't need to be protected if the, like, my rigid hand, the bottle's keeping it out of the way. You see what I'm saying? If you have three bars coming down in front of your face, the only way that any edged weapon is going to be able to get in there is if they're jabbing directly in. Now, you might say, isn't getting stabbed in the face also just as bad? Yes, but it's also a lot easier to defend against rather than just receiving a cut from any angle on your face. So one of the big ones, and it's cost effective too, is using things to get in the way of blades or weapons or any type of anything ever reaching your snout in the first place. So visors are incredibly useful for the face and per snout to protect as they cut off vertical strikes from multiple angles. Now, what do I mean by visors? Sort of like on your something like a hat, your visor. Imagine I'm wearing a kettle helmet and it goes all the way around and somebody strikes at me from the top. They do a strike you know, overhand like that that's got to come down, and if it hits my visor first, it's never actually reaching my face. The angle that they have to come in is it, it, basically you're cutting off anything from that overhand angle is going to hit that brim first. It's the whole design concept around kettle helmets, and it works fantastically for furries. Now, you could also have things that protrude out the sides and protect your cheeks. Like this guy here has a bar coming out in front. He's an ottoman serval, by the way. He's got a big bar to come out from protecting anything that could be coming in at the face, anything from these angles. And I didn't, I'm not the best artist in the world, but the cheek plates here would theoretically make it so that even at a lower angle, it would meet at a point between the cheek and that bar on the front. So even just having something like a bar right and down the middle protects your face from more angles than you would think. And if you're fighting somebody that's using a weapon like a saber, or a scimitar, or any other number of weapons that primary function is cutting, 
and they're trained to know how to use it for cutting, and they're trained to know how to use it for fighting, like slashing attacks, you're gonna protect a lot more blows than you would think. And the proof is in the reality of it that these helmets existed for a long period of time. This one is probably the most obvious in its design of like, three big bars out the front would probably do really well from, attack, from protecting your snout against anywhere that wasn't directly stabbing in between those bars. This guy doesn't need a full faceplate of armor to do that. All he needs is those bars out front to protect him. This is a really easy, cost-effective way to protect your snout and also leave your room open for breathing, room open for vision, hearing really well, things like that. If that trade-off to you is worth it, which it was for a lot of people, because this type of armor comes after the really famous uh, Hunskull bassinets of the medieval ages, this design lasts for a lot longer of a time. Because it's just, it's, it's better to see and breathe and hear really well than it is to like not get stabbed, like if you're just being really careless about who's thrusting things at your face, okay? <laughs> So an example of that helmet that I showed before on a furry would be like a Bowie Ocean helmet on this boar character I drew, showing that from the side you can kind of see better that like the angle that you have to come in is a lot smaller because you got that visor protecting him. And it's all on one piece, it's all very cheap, and from the sides too, if something tried to come in like this, it would be hitting the helmet first, okay? You could still thrust into the face. That's definitely true, but if, you, if you're a soldier sometimes, and a lot of people did, they thought the trade-off for the vision benefits and the breathing was worth it. Now, let's say you do want to armor the snout directly because you're fighting on a horse and you're worried about lances coming in at your face, all right? Let's say you have to. Basically, the main thing you want to worry about is keeping things from resting on top of your snout because the moment that they do, that's gonna get hit and the force is just gonna transfer straight into your nose. And it doesn't matter if, um, it really doesn't matter if you get cut, but the most sensitive part of your body receives a ton of trauma because you're probably gonna get hurt and probably gonna stop fighting anyway. Um, and then that just leaves them open to do whatever they want when you're you know, writhing in pain. Um, so don't over pad this now either because the moment that you over pad it, you're gonna heat up, but even worse, because the snout is in front of your face, the more you pat it on top, you're cutting off your vision to a point where you basically can't see anything, okay? So when you're patting, when you're, when you're like protecting your snout, right? Basically, you wanna have rigid protection that isn't gonna come down on top of it, but also isn't restricting your vision too much. So also, a good thing to mention is Easy to avoid this is have armor that deflects down and away from the snout. So have this sort of cone, conical shape to the, like, like have a line down the middle to keep blows directed away and not towards your eyes. You wanna make sure you have lips there to keep things from going into your eyes. Good examples of these are on here. Utilize your gorget to protect your snout, okay? That jaw, that, that neck protector I was talking about before, that's gonna keep things from coming up in here. And the best part about these is that they're articulated. So let's say this guy, right, this, this wild dog here, he's got his visor. It comes down on top to protect the snout up front. But he's got a bar here and a hole there so that it doesn't rest on his snout and it doesn't rest on the gorget, but it rests on a peg that allows it to come down on and basically be fully rigid away from his face and it protects him. And when he needs to, all he needs to do is lift that up Lower the, lower the gorget, and boom, he can breathe, he can see, he can do everything he needs to do, he can talk, without having this super, uh, 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 like super restrictive design, basically. That's very simple practicality for snouts. Here's another good example I wanted to show, was armets. Come down and clasp on the sides of your face, so they lift up, and then they clasp down, so it can protect your chin, protect your jaw, I have a feeling these would be very common with furries because it's a really easy way to protect your jawline for, for protecting that super exposed underside of your snout. And um, when you're designing armor, consider doing ones with hinges. Consider doing ones that clasp down. Consider doing ones that, if your animal has a weird head shape, 
I did this with deer once and people were like, that's 10 trillion IQ. It's really not. All you need to do is have it come around and clasp from the sides and all of a sudden you can fit antlers in there now. And it's like, these are just things that people don't often think about that you can do. Just have it be very, you know, modifiable, that kind of thing. This is my favorite section, antlers and horns, because these are something that I feel like a lot of people don't really know where to start with. Antlers and horns in the wrong context can create some serious problems, okay? They provide a very useful tool and an incredibly vulnerable target to weapons that can hook and bind. If you have anything that is attached to your head and is easily grabbable or easily hookable, it is immediately going to be an incredibly big liability, okay? That's just the start. They can become burdensome when in close quarters and in tight formations. If you're in something like a siege tower, probably don't want those things knocking all over the place, okay? Just to show some examples of the kinds of things I'm talking about, there is numerous types of weapons out there that are designed specifically for hooking because hooking underneath the kneecaps, hooking in your elbows, hooking underneath your armpits can be incredibly useful. Hooking behind the neck, but if you are a deer furry fighting somebody with a weapon that has a hook on it, and a lot of weapons do, more than you would think, you can be incredibly vulnerable for just getting that thing in there, bound and being tugged down, and all of a sudden, you're in a very, very bad spot, okay? Even something like a halberd, which doesn't have a hook on it visibly, this here would still grab an antler easily well. You basically just need an edge that you can hook things with, okay? Let's say you have your sword, right? You turn it around and you grab it by the blade. Now the cross guard is out front. You can hook with that. There are a ton of weapons that can hook. I would say most weapons that can actually hook because it's an incredibly useful tool. It's a really good tool to have on the battlefield and it's very vulnerable to deer. And, and any, basically any antlered, any horned character. But it's not all bad. Oh yeah, here's an example of somebody doing that hooking thing I was talking about. Well, he's actually striking them in the head, but you could hook with that. And they do talk about doing it. Antlers and horns can provide a natural advantage over the fact that, like, if you've ever tried to fence and you end up fencing somebody with a left hand, your, your entire game is thrown off, okay? Let's say that you're fighting with a saber and you're, you've won all your duels and you win them because you always strike them in the head. You get a really good head strike, end the fight really quickly. A saber's not going to cut through an antler. Just downright, it's not going to work, okay? If somebody tries to strike at your head, you might be at an advantage simply from the fact that you've got this deflective barrier up there that people have never had to deal with before they've had to encounter you. Now, if you're in a society full of deer, maybe the people you're fighting have already just devised a weapon or devised a way to counter that. That's fine. But at the same time, it should be noted that if deer characters are not super common in your um, world, it might be very jarring to somebody who's used to fighting in a certain way to suddenly have to account for the fact that now these are there, okay? Also, they serve as a risky barrier for opponents who strike them and risk end up binding their weapons in them, okay? So you're using your sword, and you decide, fuck it, I'm going to strike him in the head. I'm not worried about hitting the antlers, they're back there. I'm going to try and hit him in the snout. Let's say you accidentally hit him anyway, and your blade gets in between one of those pointy parts of the antlers, right? And they make a sudden movement, and all of a sudden the sword is jerked up here, and you're completely thrown off balance, you're completely thrown off your game. All of a sudden, this guy has a really, really good way of just absolutely clobbering you, because he, you, know, you weren't expecting to be jerked around like that. It totally threw off your movements. So... Antlers are incredibly protective as well, uh, depending on the context. It's all contextual. So just showing off some different types of antlers. Imagine trying to strike this guy in the head, especially because this would be a, a, a huge character, right? Huge guy. And all of this, I would, I'm not going to lie, I would be pretty much aiming for anywhere else besides the head. And that's where most of the kill shots come from. So if you could... Get people to not strike you in the head, you're already at a really good advantage. Now, if they don't have a hooking weapon, they might be fucked. And that's a really good thing if you're a caribou, okay? Rams, too. He's not as much at risk for that hooking thing as we're talking about because they're a lot closer in. 
But at the same time, if you try and strike from the side, he's got these two big horns that don't have any nerves in them. They're not like super vulnerable to being, you know, they're, they're not gonna hurt super bad when they get struck. He's definitely not gonna die. And suddenly you're totally thrown off because one of your main angles of attack before is now cut off. So here's an example of where situation where you might be striking towards somebody's head and their antlers might really get in the way. Another thing to think about is the fact that a lot of movements and a lot of combat happens above your head with your hands and your arms above your head. So antlers are getting in the way for a lot of these types of things. And if you're using a weapon that primarily revolves around using overhand strikes, you might be out of, it. You might be out of luck with a deer character. Now, another example, just basically showing you guys overhand strikes, that type of thing. Now, when it comes to wrestling, they become incredibly uh, a burden because it can be used for leverage, it can be used to jerk your head around. But they can also be incredibly useful because now you've got this giant sharp rack here that you can literally stab somebody with the moment that you get into a wrestling match, okay? Now, while useful in a bind, they can also be, make, yeah, like I said, you can be vulnerable to getting your head jerked around. Now, you might be thinking, Pelzi, we're talking about guys fighting in war here, okay? These guys aren't going to get into a wrestling match. That's not going to happen, okay? Somebody's going to get stabbed. Somebody's going to get shamed. And what you've done is you've given me the perfect opportunity to show you one of my favorite videos of all time. These are two guys that are... Oh, is it loading? Please? No, come on. Come on, YouTube. Come on. Oh, maybe it just didn't, maybe it didn't load because I'm not on the Wi-Fi. Oh, come on. Try like that. Will it work here? No, I think i got to get on the Wi-Fi. Hold on. <laughs> Let me get on the way. I really want to show this because it rules. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Come on. You know what? I'll do my phone. My phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Cool. Sorry about that. What are we, how are we doing on time? Damn. No way. No way. No <laughs> way. I guess the two hours kind of worked out. Sorry, I'm boring you guys to tears. This is great. Yeah. 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 I was enjoying it so far. Yeah. Sorry, I know it's a lot. I really... Good. My throat, bro. As soon as you said the avian thing, I'm just thinking, Guy Marshawn, avian super soldier. Like <laughs> yeah, I mean, for world. real. All right, here we go. Let me see if I can bring this up. Please, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So these are two guys fighting with longsword. And these guys aren't fencing. They're fighting with the intention of hitting each other with a kill strike, okay? And these two guys are trained. Right? They're both very good at this type of thing, and they're both very like competent fighters, okay? And watch what happens when they go in for your average longsword fight. You might assume that one of them is gonna kill each other with a sword, but, come on, yo, come on. No audio, come on. slam instead okay so like I said before it goes up above in a head bind and then the guy gets freaking <laughs> imagine getting slammed by that guy holy shit he's huge oh, I'm sorry I want to see it again that's so funny gets freaking gets slammed so oh it's better the second time right. yeah. so Wrestling and hand-to-hand, -hand, like, like your actual hands are a huge part of, of combat, okay? Huge part. Can I interject real quick? Yeah. So, talking about antlers, uh, just as somebody who does mostly on stuff, um, yeah. the, the wrestling aspect, even in that video right there, you see him go in, you see him go low, and you see him get head position. Yeah. Where he puts his head underneath the other guy's head. So, if you've got... A bunch of antlers here, and you get head position. <laughs> All in your yeah. gut, man. You're getting you're stabbed. Right Not only are you face. getting the slam of your life, you're getting stabbed too. So <laughs> antlers are a big deal when it comes to wrestling. Okay. So here's some good examples. Look at this guy. You imagine this dude with the antlers on, bro. <laughs> He's getting stabbed up if that's a caribou, bro. I'm telling you. 
They're not as big of a disadvantage in all situations as you would think. I know a lot of people that say, <laughs> this guy too getting flipped. So, antlers, first of all, are a seasonal thing, okay? They come and go with the season. So, they can be removed too, because the main thing that keeps them is the velvet. That's the only real part with blood flow. It's the only real part with the nervous system. They can break. Um, they can also be removed. And another thing people don't realize is if they're really a big issue in your setting, they can be reformed. They can be broken, and using tools, you can basically mold them into a completely different shape. Or, I think you can get them to like grow in a way that they basically won't expand any larger at all. So they can be molded. And if you really are just the biggest prima donna, and you don't want to get hit in your antlers, you could pad them with something like gambeson, something like cloth or silk, and it'll do the job just fine, okay? So you don't need to worry too much about that. You can put corks on the end, not the other guy's as well. Yeah, <laughs> ears, okay? Now ears are important because they have a lot of nerves in them, but they're usually all down here at the base of the ears, especially on canines. Sometimes they have a main nerve that goes up through the back, but they need to be kept open for hearing, okay? Hearing is incredibly important because if all of a sudden somebody orders a retreat, you kind of don't want to be the last guy left when everybody starts surrounding you and now they're all poking you with those sticks we were talking about. Now, also important, like, okay, I'm sorry, I think it's sacrilege to draw furry art and not have the ears out, okay? It just, look, the silhouette immediately becomes more human, okay? The ears are important and they vary depending on species, obviously. So if you're uh, using a character that has super big ears, you're going to have to account for that in the design. That's just the way it is. Now, most species can afford to protect their ears with a small lip around the base of the opening to deflect blows away from them. So the main thing here is, is that when you're str getting struck in the head, what you don't want is that gliding down and glancing off the side and it hitting your ear and cutting it straight off. That's the main thing you want to avoid. A lot of people go, Oh, what if they just strike specifically at the ear? Hey, guess what? They got a snout, which is even closer to you and actually can kill them if you hit it. Nobody's going to strike for the ears because if you're striking in combat, you're doing it with the intention of killing your opponent and ending it as quick as possible. Okay, you want to finish the job and get out of there because we're terrifying. Okay, so you don't want to just strike at easy, nothing targets like ears. Okay. But if you get it cut off, it's going to be painful and you want to avoid that. You could also use something like a gambeson around the back that just comes up on the back and, and you know, your ears kind of fit nicely into a little lip to keep it in place. And it's, they're so flexible and they're so like non-rigid that nothing's going to cut through them. It's not like you have to worry about it being chopped off if you just have any kind of moderate amount of padding there. So what you don't want to do is make a design with giant metal ears that poke out that somebody could just grab and yank on and now you've got the antler problem where it's like you just hook the shit out of them. Don't have giant metal ears unless for some reason you really think that looks awesome. In which case, go for it. Also, if you're doing a parade design or a ceremonial design or a ritual design, you probably don't have to worry about that as much. You could probably put as big ears as you want on there. That's basically the point I'm getting at is like, this, in conjunction with the other idea, is how you make good designs. Think about the design process and, and think about this stuff secondary. Okay? So here I show an example of just simple padding on the back of the ears is going to keep them from coming off. Okay? And you've got that lip around the base here that protects glancing blows from the top, cutting off parts of your ears. Because nine times out of ten if you're in combat and somebody's attacking you, they're going to go for the head because that's the easy kill shot. That's as simple as. Now, paws and armor. I don't really go super into this one because it just depends entirely on your art style, okay? I won't lie, when I draw, I just basically do hands with paw pads and they're kind of a little bit more paw shaped, okay? Now, some animals have super, um, like their pads and their hands themselves are very resistant because they're used to running around on them all the time. So they can't be as sensitive as our hands. But if you're a furry, you're not doing that. So does that even translate over? It just depends on what you want to do. So I'm not going to go super deep into paws. I'm basically just going to say 
you should think about protecting them the same way you would your hands or your feet and make sure that you're not restricting movement too much if you're a character that needs to go fast or you're a character that needs to um, or has you know, very recognizable paws. I don't know, leave the paws open. I like seeing them. All right. So don't, don't restrict any natural advantage of the body structure of your anthros. Work with degenerate legs and be sure to recognize the differences in shape. What I mean by this is degenerate legs can be drawn in any number of ways, okay? If you're one of the ones that has the high up knees and that kind of slouch look, you probably have to worry more about this section of your knees getting hit than this one simply because it's the one that's more open, it's the one that's more forward, it's closer to the opponent, it's a bigger target, all right? So a lot of that depends on art style, but just apply the concepts that I've already talked about, protecting large areas first, protecting vital areas first. Tails. Tails are behind you. They're usually out of the way. Oftentimes they're used for balance by a lot of species. Dogs use them to balance, foxes use them to balance. What you don't want to do is over armor something that is not usually going to be struck anyway. Now, you can armor them. You can put cloth on them, you know, the gambeson we talked about. Chainmail would work fine. Plate would work. If you really, I think, I'm going to be honest, I think plated, like armor on tails looks great. So I do it anyway most of the time. So it just looks good. I don't care. I'm not worried about, none of these people are ever going to get into actual war. I don't care. I do what looks good, okay? But at the same time, recognize if your guys are fighting in a large group, um, oftentimes um, people behind them might step on it, people behind them might accidentally hit it, and that would hurt like a bitch. If you're in single combat, think about the fact that it can be grabbed during wrestling. Uh, you know, it could be grabbed, if you're fighting somebody else and there's a multiple opponents at the same time, one of them can absolutely grab your tail and fuck everything up. But the problem is, is that can happen whether or not you have it armored or not. So some people talk about tucking it up underneath the, the stomach and like keeping it here. Sacrilege. You took the tail and the ears out of the furry silhouette. Why are you even drawing furry art in the first place? I don't okay? know. I just just don't do it. Okay? And then, um, obviously, it's like, think about if you were an animal, right? Would you really want your tail hidden? Would you really want that thing tucked up and not seen? Like, Ears are very expressive. Our faces are very expressive. People put faces on the front of their helmets because they want to be recognized even though they have a helmet on. Your tail is super recognizable and tells a lot of things about like aggression, uh, uh, submission, things like that. I have a hard time imagining a world in which furry characters don't look at the idea of hiding your tail also as cowardly, sacrilege. It's bad. Don't do it. Have your tail out. It looks good. Okay. So when I talk about decoration, I'm talking about things like um, dagging, okay? This looks beautiful. There's another tabard like I was talking about. Your tail is a canvas. Dress it up. Don't just have it sticking out of the back of the design. If you are, uh, are uh, the rest of your body's dressed up, you have all these colors on you, the tail would be colored too. The tail would obviously be something that would be decorated a lot. Put things like feathers on there. Put things like ribbons on there. If you're on a horse and that thing's flowing out behind you, Make it look super long. Make it look super cool, okay? Get creative. It's fantasy. Enjoy it. Make everything look cool. You have the ability to do that with fantasy. So, like I said, it's risky, it's risky in multiple opponent situations. Risky when wrestling. And uh, particularly long tails. If you have a massive tail, you might want to just, you know, roll it up a little bit. Kind of have it hanging out the back. Maybe just, if it's unreasonably long, maybe take care of that. <laughs> now, finishing all this off, the designs for costumes and armor in your settings should be built upon the world and the story that they're in. They should reflect the world that you're trying to tell. If you're creating a fantasy world, chances are you want to tell a story. Your world should reflect the story. The way that your characters look and the way that their design is should reflect the story. It should reflect the characters that you put in them. Because your characters should be deep and their, their clothing should emphasize that. Okay. Understanding how armor works can make you better designs, but you don't need it necessarily, okay? It's only to help you. I'm not trying to tell you any of these things to say, oh, your armor doesn't have room for padding. If any of, anybody says that in your comments, just block immediately. Okay? This shit's so dumb, okay? 
And finally, strive to design costumes and armor that enhance your character's animal traits and explore them. Don't hide them away. That's the big takeaway here. Your armor should emphasize the fact that your characters are anthropomorphic and not make them look more human. So, that's my panel. Hey. Yo! We have 10 minutes for questions. I'm sorry, I had, dude, I had no idea that was gonna take that long. Oh lordy. 10 minutes for questions, anybody has any? Go. Uh, what are your thoughts on something like uh, razor wire or thorns to protect on the tail grappling thing? So, like I said before, if your character's fighting in a formation and he's got razor wire on his tail, the dude behind you is probably not going to be too happy about that. Okay? <laughs> also, your tail isn't not feeling. You can have, like, if obviously I'm assuming you mean, like, on, on top of something like padding to keep it from yeah. stabbing yourself. But also, yeah. can you really do that much I, I guess if you had like spikes on it it would be pretty cool but think about this if you fall down and that's behind you do you really want that spiky behind you when you fall on your ass and all of a sudden the back of your legs is being stabbed it's just I think that would look great in like a Mad Max kind of design yeah, yeah. yeah. that would look a, sick that would look good. different kind of that would world look sick. different kind of world yeah. yeah that would look really cool very what? dark soulsy. It's because he was talking like a grab Again. the tail on like the one on one thing. It's like, well, if you make it, I'm supposed to grab it. Yeah. Yes. What's up? Okay, so hypothetically, right, the bird get nerfed. They don't have to <laughs> <laughs> See, I did not even entertain the idea of birds who can't fly because that's literally birds who can't fly. Why would. That's just so sad. Like, why even include them? Yeah, like a kiwi. Yeah, I, I, I thought about those <laughs> kiwi. Dude, I'm not going to lie, I want that kiwi armor, bro. That would be fucking dope. Okay, but so like, let's yeah. say you have like the talons and the beak, right? Mm -hmm. You said one of the most important things would be like, you know, defending the snout. Would yeah. there be a way in armor to like, use the snout as a weapon instead while still protecting the face? Because they're so close together. Hmm. I, I, like I would idea. I would say it. that if that was a good idea, it would have been done in real life with your face as well. I think the main thing is you just don't want anything near your face. You don't want to be, he like, you can headbutt with a helmet on reasonably well, but, like, at the end of the day, if you're at the position where you can hit somebody with your face, you're, you're way too close than you ever want to be. Razor wire. You don't even want to be planning for, it's like, it's like planning for a home invasion. You just, the protection against a home invasion is just trying to never have one. That's the main yeah, protection. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't really, I didn't really touch too much on biting because you could bite now. <laughs> you could okay, you bite now. Yeah, guy in the back. It depends too much on the animal itself. If you're a salamander, probably not much. If you're something like a a dragon, you're probably fine. Like <laughs> you probably don't need to worry about it at all. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. Dude, dragons are just overpowered as fuck. Just straight up. I got, I got some inputs on birds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, if in a world you could build a city downward, that would be cool. Like, <laughs> That's some dark Yeah, 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 that'd be fun. Um, like, more armor. Like a mole city. I love yeah, that. More yeah. armor on top, man. Yeah, yeah. No. It's like, it's like, uh, it's like Roman shoe hole where they, like, hit, like, a turtle or a kid. Yeah. Oh, yeah, except yeah. upwards. Yeah. Uh, like, for bows and stuff. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, I was thinking assassin is another good archetype, and then I'm, I'm gonna skip so you can answer your question. <laughs> Go for it. How do I find you on the internet? Wait, what? How do I find you on the internet? Oh, Where thank you God you in? asked. <laughs> you just bring it up. Oh, like, so oh, my Twitter oh, account. What? My, my, oh, here, no. Let me make a new slide that's just my at on Twitter. <laughs> I used to. I don't use it anymore. I, I basically deactivated it because uh, I just... People, people kept messaging me about it, and I was like... That's how it works. Yeah, people kept messaging me, and I was like, 
I never use this thing. They're like, I messaged you on for affinity. I'm like, I never use it anymore. So well, I do that. I want to talk about like a real life example that I saw because my buddy, he put a, uh, like a little cloth wrapped around the end of his tail to keep it clean at the con. Yeah. I was like, that's a good idea. Uh, that's wild. my Twitter at. Oh, let me present this. Hellsy yeah. scum. Yeah. Uh, follow this guy. He's uh, my, my at. He's not that lame. Don't follow me. What did you do with oh, the deer? What? What did you do with the deer? Uh, I sold it to this guy. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, so you have the deer? Yeah, he's the new deer. Oh, shit. Oh. I, I, I love the deer, but like... He was, first of all, I've had him since 2014. I think I'm entitled to change my Sona every once in a while, okay? Every once in a while, I just wanted to change. And, um, yeah, I don't know, I, I liked him, but like, Blue Deer's not super me. At the time, I designed him that way because I thought it was funny, like, to have a character that like looked super, like, comical and toony, but like, his main thing was like, combat, but, I mean, Nowadays, I just wanted something that, I, I don't know, fit me better at 22 than my blue deer fit me at, like, 16. Hey, I'm 22. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Dude, your skunk owns, by the way. It's great. How long did you design armor for otters? Because, uh, basically, they're semi-aquatic, and I never kind of had my So the, the, the problem becomes that fighting in water is going to take its own kind of, like, necessities, right? So, things like cloth and metal don't work because cloth gets filled with water and it weighs you down and you get basically dragged to the bottom by the weight of your own equipment. The more equipment you bring into the water, the worse because that weight's going to prevent you from swimming well. It's going to tire you out quicker. Honestly, I never even like thought about that. <laughs> it's just <laughs> such, a, it's such a different... It's like, how do you design something for, like, fighting in the air? It's just, it's a totally different world. Um, if, if, if I had to, like, say anything, it would be that the Olmex discovered rubber. So that came around a long time ago, and you can use that. Uh, if you're an aquatic people, you probably developed a lot of technology that can, um, you know, be used better in the water. Shark chain mail. They have this extremely fine chain mail that divers wear. It's not mm -hmm. to keep the shark from biting, biting into Yeah, you. yeah, I've and seen that actually. It weighs practically nothing. That's but right. but isn't that, but isn't that, um, isn't that, isn't like mod, I mean, yeah, I guess. Well, yeah, 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 you're right, you're right. No, you're right, you're right. It weighs enough to make it so you can't swim, though. It, oh, you it, can't it swim in it? It weighs down completely. A full shark chain suit weighs about 60 pounds. I didn't know that. Oh, yes. That is it lot. weighs about as much as regular chain mail because, yes, so basically a shark don't can fight bite you. And yeah. Don't fight like like sharks. Yeah. Like yeah, don't fight sharks. Yeah. Stand a shark bite, which is a my, my big takeaway on the otter thing would just be think about weight. Think about weight and think about what materials that weight is going to um, exponentially grow with once you get into the water. Okay, go on. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Go ahead. You brought up like the whole thing of religious fighting. Oh shit, you gotta get out of here. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry guys, I when I took my time. Aww. Aww. I know. If you have a question, ask me after the panel. Um, are your commissions open? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm retiring from drawing realistic things. I'll be drawing wizards and, and Old school. Okay. Thanks for